So I hope you had a great lunch. I was just telling a colleague that um, I'm a carnivore, so it's unusual for a salad to make me feel so full. And that's just pretty much how I'm feeling right now. So as we continue with our program, I want to introduce to you uh, Professor Allegra de Bonaventura. And she is going to talk about, I quote, for Adam's sake, a family saga in early New England. And her description of this is, you know, for Adam's sake is the story of two third generation New Englanders and their interwoven families. Joshua Hempstead, a well-regarded shipwright, farmer, magistrate, and a magistrate in New London, Connecticut, and Adam Jackson, an enslaved husbandman whom Joshua owned for more than 30 years. Hempstead's remarkable diary kept from 1711 to approximately 1758 forms the basis of this intimate narrative of domestic life and enslavement into the colonial north. So as we delve into really a bit more of an intimate fashion as we've heard early on, Let's give a hand to Dr. Bonaventura. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And uh, like the other panelists before me, I want to thank so much the organizers of this symposium, uh, the Museum of Old Newbury, and also the Governor's Academy for hosting us. It's wonderful to be here. Never been here before. Um, so as you probably guessed, so my talk will take you to an earlier time in New England history um, than, than our speakers this morning. And I feel that it's very apt. A, a couple of things resonated with me and what I'd like to talk about in, in James's presentation uh, before lunch. And he talked, for, in, for instance, about that very conscious forgetting, which is what New England did in terms of its uh, uh, its history, um, the, the history of black people in New England and the history of slavery in New England. So today I'd like to tell you one of those consciously forgotten stories, um, very consciously forgotten stories, and it's from a story from New London, Connecticut, so not too far away. And um, it's about a book that I wrote a few years ago. It was actually my PhD dissertation. And I've noticed there's a very interesting, I have to pay my respect to the um, sort of scholarly genealogy here. We have a lot of mentors and mentees. And I, uh, true confessions, John Demos, who spoke uh, at the top of the, the program, was my advisor. So it seems like we're all very <laughs> interconnected, um, which is probably not a surprise. So, and as a student of John Demos, actually, um, I'm really kind of an accidental historian of slavery in New England. I don't really consider myself an historian of, of slavery. Um, I came at this project and this dissertation originally as a historian of family life and domestic life. So I was interested in families, parents and children, uh, grandparents, um, larger social circles, and what went on in the home, really. And so, my guide in, in trying to understand this interior domestic world better was this incredible document that you can see here. And this is a diary. This is the diary of Joshua Hempstead, who was a very ordinary but kind of upright uh, English colonial American um, in New London, Connecticut. Um, he was born in 1678, so we're really dealing with a much earlier period here and a different consciousness. Um, he was born in uh, 1678, and he died in 1758, so he doesn't even come close to seeing the revolution. And he was a pretty ordinary guy. Uh, in the introduction, um, we heard you know, he was a farmer, like most New Englanders. He was a shipwright, so a shipbuilder. He lived in New London, so like Newburyport, it was a port, and a lot of people engaged in trade were in the maritime industry. 
Um, he also was a little bit of a jack of all trades. He made coffins, he carved gravestones, he um, oh, r uh, built houses, um, built stone walls. So he did all kinds of things around the neighborhood. And he also later in life became a public servant of some note, just locally. Not, so not a famous guy, not an important man um, in any grand historical sense, but a locally prominent uh, farmer. But also definitely not a member of the elite. He only had a shipwright's apprenticeship as an education, never went to university. But as you can see, he was quite literate, if not literary. Um, he kept this diary for at least 47 years. So, and he lived quite a long life until he was 80 years old. And frankly, it was probably more than 47 years. This is, they're just three pieces that have survived. And I actually think this is one of the great New England um, primary sources that we have. You know, it's monumental and it covers such a sweep of time and with such depth in a community and of also an individual person and his family. Um, so you, you might kind of wonder, well, why haven't I heard of this diary? I mean, maybe you have, but I had not heard of it, I can tell you. And it was certainly known in particularly genealogical circles where it's just a gold mine of, you know, birth, death, funerals, uh, sicknesses, local events, that kind of thing. Um, but it is very much of an almanac style diary. So lots of weather, lots of, uh, farming, uh, typical entries. I planted corn. I chopped wood. I carried wood home. Um, I was at home all day. That, that happens a million times. That means he stayed around the, the, his house lot. Um, emotion is not in here, and it would not, would not have really occurred to him to put emotion in here. Um, when family members die, you know, the kinds of entries are, my dear, my dear wife died today. Okay. Um, so not a great source for what I really wanted to find out, which was sort of effective life, the interior, the mind, you know, what makes people tick. But never, nevertheless, incredible, and I aimed to mine this thing for all it was worth. So... And a little bit about the Hempstead family. I told you that you know they were ordinary kind of archetypal English colonials of you know the Puritan. He would not have called himself Puritan, but they were members of the Congregational Church, artisanal family. His grandfather had come over. He was a blacksmith. His father had been a wheelwright, so a wheelmaker, and then he's a shipwright. So these are not members of the elite. These are really kind of bread and butter English colonists but still a very respectable family and a propertied family because they had been among the founding families in New London, Connecticut, which was founded actually by um, uh, John Winthrop Jr. Uh, in, in, you know, very early on. Um, and so very ordinary guy in many ways. Two extraordinary things about him though. Um, the first is undeniably this diary. <laughs> Um, and could you change the slide, please? Great. Okay. It's undeniably the diary, which it's just, I can't express how rare it is to have a diary f from of this length and consistency. He wrote in almost every single day for more than 47 years from someone from this class, from this social stratum. So we do have diaries, people like Samuel Sewell, a merchant in Boston. We have, there are a bunch of clerical diaries. They are very different. This is a farmer's diary about farming. Um, so I said there were two things about him, and I should tell you, so Joshua's house exists. It's, um, so I had not just the diary, but also his house, um, to interpret, and I did a lot of material culture interpretation to try to understand what was going on in the house and the lives of people in the house. The other extraordinary thing about Joshua was a choice that he made, and I do believe it was a choice, and that was when he was 38 years old, he was the father of nine children. In fact, he had his wife had just given birth 
to his ninth child, a little baby named Molly. Within a week of Molly's birth, however, her mother died of a fever. Within another week, um, Joshua's eldest son, who was 17 years old, Joshua Jr., also died. So in the space of one week, he lost two of the most important people in his life. He also became what we would call a single parent. Um, and of eight children, uh, ranging in age from one week old to 16 years old. So as a, as a historian of the family, needless to say, I, I mean, I'm sorry for his loss, but um, the, it meant that his diary, unlike other men's diaries, he had to cope with the loss of his wife and how to manage the family. So he wrote more about family life, about the interior life, domestic life, than other men would have had to do. And he made this extraordinary choice. So in this time period, in the colonial period in general, um, I mean, obviously losing one spouse was fairly common. Um, and most men, and the statistics are kind of insane. It's like 98% of um, men who lost their wives would remarry, not just remarry, but remarry in less than a year. And Joshua, at 38 years old, made the pretty incredible decision never to remarry. So here you have a diarist and a widower with eight children. So I'm thinking this is particularly rich to understand family life. So I set out to write a book about the man, the diary, his family life, and I kind of wanted to take some of the lens that women's history has shown onto women's lives and looking at their lives, you know, broadening it to the public sphere, take the same kind of lens and turn it back on men and, and whose lives in uh, historiography traditionally have been seen, you know, through their public activities and really turn it inside the house and see what's going on in the house. So that was my, that was my idea anyway. Next slide. So this actually is possibly Joshua's desk. It's a little bit of a recreation. Um, a lot of the furniture in the house is originally from the Hempsteads. Um, the house was continuously occupied until the 1930s by the Hempstead family. So it's, it's pretty amazing. And it, it's a historic house museum. You can visit it. This is actually what Joshua called his chamber. It's on the second floor. And this would be the room that he was probably born in and the room he definitely died in. Um, and so he spent, you know, 80 years of his life in here. He did have what he called a truckle bed in the room, a trundle, trundle bed. And kids, some of his kids did sleep in the room with him in the, in the trundle bed. Um, so as I embarked on this project, as, uh, you know, the, the diary actually was published. It's over 700 pages, you know, almost 50 years. So it's a, it's a big, big beast. And, you know, I started by really analyzing the diary. I spent about a year just even setting up categories and those kinds of things. But pretty quickly, I started realizing that I was bumping up against another person who was important. And this, this person's name was Adam. And a casual reader of Joshua's diary might skip through and say, um, in fact, there's a class at Yale uh, where, where I work, um, which students who read pieces of the diary were asked, who is Adam? And the answers would be, well, he's, maybe he's a son. Maybe he's a relative. Maybe he's a neighbor. Maybe he's a servant. Well, Adam. Um, well, I, in the parlance of the time, they would have called him a servant. Um, but Adam was Adam Jackson, and he was an enslaved man from born in Connecticut who was part of the Hempstead household um, after Joshua purchased him at the age of 27 in 1727. So confronted by this reality, and here I was expecting to, you know, sort of unlock the secrets of the household. Well, here was one secret. Um, and, and I should say, it's, it's very interesting about the forgetting of this history. It, if you visit the, the Hempstead House, for example, for the, almost the whole of the 20th century, nobody ever talked about slavery. 
they did talk about the ancestors who then got involved in abolitionism. But nobody mentioned Adam. Um, I'm happy to say my, that my book has changed that. And now the whole site has been reinterpreted with Adam kind of almost taking center stage now. So, so that's kind of exciting. And it, it's also a cue as to different ways that we can retell this narrative with black history at the center, not marginalized at the center where it actually was in real time. So um, it was in this house, the Hempstead house, that um, Adam Jackson and Joshua Hempstead lived for more than 30 years together and often working together, often working side by side. And by that, I mean in the field, you know, doing the same identical task. I don't by in any way mean that it was the same experience for an enslaved man versus the man who enslaved him. Um, and let's change the slide. That's the outside of the house. It looks a bit fancier now. Um, it was more of a, it was, the house itself was originally built in the 1640s and then there was like a new, new version of the house built in 1678. So this is the 1678 version with a couple of additions onto it. So in confronting Adam, in the same way that we're confronting, you know, uh, African American history in New England that has been consciously forgotten, for me, I was confronted with the existence of Adam in this little New England family life that I could have fantasized was this, you know, homogenous little Puritan world. Um, and in, in time, I realized the more I studied the diary, I could not tell Joshua's story or the story of the Hempstead family without telling Adam's story. They were the same story. Um, just as I couldn't tell Adam's without Joshua's. But as a, as a historian, I also knew that this would be a tough road because of the sources. Um, what were the chances, for example, that I would be able to tell very much about Adam, um, his life, how he felt, um, what his experience was? I mean, with the diary, I can't even tell how Joshua felt when his wife died. So how would I possibly use the diary of the man who's enslaving him to understand the effective life of, of an enslaved person? But the, the diary is what I had, and so that's where I started. And what the diary is so good for, and um, it's a, because it's a farmer's diary, it's a diary of work. So what I did find is I was able to find out a lot about what Adam did in terms of work. What did he do on a daily basis? What did he do on a yearly basis? And because it covered such a span of time, I could tell what, what Adam did and Joshua when they were young, when they were in their 20s and 30s, and then when they're what was considered old men. So really over the life course, pretty fascinating and unique opportunity to look at that. Um, so I, I went to the diary and I pulled out everything that I could that had to do with Adam. And I was actually blown away. There are 50 pages on Adam Jackson. So again, a problematic source, no question about that, but 50 pages, 50 pages of a man's life and I, it, I came to realize that he may be one of the most well-documented individual enslaved people from this early period of American history. So Adam was born in 1700, you know, not 1800. So he was born in 1700 and he died in 1758. And after taking the 50 pages of the diary, um, I then went on to other sources, local sources like land sources, uh, land records, probate records. And where I really found the gold mine, and the historians in the room will know what I'm talking about, is in court records. And I ended up reading 100 years of court records for the New London County. And what I found is that enslaved people, indentured people, Native American people were all through the, the court records, all through the court records, and providing incredible snapshots of people's lives. And also because often witness testimony is written down, sometimes even in a kind of Q&A form, you actually get the words of people. Obviously it's you know, transposed through the secretary, 
but um, but you know it's it's closer than you know four steps removed. Um, and so and what I found and what I realized was and um, Eddie brought this up at the beginning. What I was writing about was actually two third generation New Englanders, Joshua Hempstead and Adam Jackson, because um, I was able to find not just, um, not just Adam himself, but I was able to go back in time and find the whole um, history of his family and even trace back to his parents and even to his grandmother, Maria, back in the 1650s. So again, here we are at the beginning of New, Eng New England you know, colonial enterprise. So, and this really kind of defied many of my original notions of you know, African-American history in New England, family life in New England. And I realized I had two families, two New England families, quintessential New England families, and I could tell their stories from the very beginning of New England. And it was for that reason that I wrote a very different book and I called it For Adam's Sake, because it is for Adam's sake that I wrote the book that I did. And I hope I did him some justice at least. Um, now let me step back for a minute and put Adam's story into some, a little bit of context. Um, and I mean, you've heard from other speakers, so I'll just be very brief. You know, yes, there was slavery in New England. Um, and Interestingly, for this area, New London County, that was kind of the capital of slavery in Connecticut, partly because of their proximity to Rhode Island, which was really the center of the slave trade, and also because in the Narragansett, um, Rhode Islanders held enslaved people in larger numbers than anywhere else in New England on these large dairy farms, which is uh, just hard to imagine. Um, and New London County is directly next to that. So I think what happened is a lot of family connections, a lot of customs, practices are similar. Even though the land in New London County was pretty bad and didn't really justify, you know, uh, like large scale farming of any kind, um, the practice of slavery spilled over um, more readily from Rhode Island. Also, the fact that it was a port, you know, all ports, obviously. Um, had higher numbers of enslaved people um, in the colonial period. Um, and who was Adam Jackson? So let me tell you a little bit about his family and his family history, which is really incredible. Um, I'm going to start with his, his grandmother, Maria. So we know her name, Maria, interesting, Spanish name. Um, she most likely was brought here in her teens as an enslaved teenager from the West Indies, as part of the West Indian trade. So the West Indian trade for New Englanders in, in Connecticut was kind of the primary trade, small ships. So it was very common that um, a captain might purchase either on spec or someone might order uh, the purchase of a human being you know, while they're in the West Indies. Maria was someone, we don't know the circumstances of how she came to be the person um, chosen um, to be purchased, but she came from the West Indies, probably her Spanish name there. Um, we know very little about her. Um, she was owned by the Rogers family, which is actually pretty interesting because they were the second richest family in colonial Connecticut behind the Winthrops. So, um, let me tell you the other thing we know about her, which is devastating. Um, in the records, she's described as, I'm quoting, Maria deaf and dumb. So when Maria came here as a teenager, she um, not only experienced a re-enslavement in a completely unfamiliar climate, culture, everything, she presumably had difficulty communicating, and so that would have been another one of her challenges. One thing that may have been a benefit um, of living in, in the household of a very wealthy family is she was not alone in terms of there were other enslaved people, there were also indentured people, there were Native American indentured people, there were even 
family groups in the, in, in, among the people living in the household. So one hopes that maybe, you know, she found some kind of companionship or camaraderie or, but we really don't know anything. Um, so Maria came here in the 1650s and the other, the big event for, for us in her life is that she had a baby in the 1670s. So this is a baby who would have been born around the same time as Joshua Hempstead, actually. So 1670s, it was a girl named Joan, and she was probably the product of rape. So, because she's described consistently by all kinds of different people from different social strata as mulatto throughout her entire life, um, which at the time would have meant um, someone of both European, presumably European and African ancestry. Um, so jo Joan was born here. We don't know who her father was, but the Rogers family, I, I personally suspect it was either the owner, James Rogers, who was the kind of the family patriarch. There was also a whole group of sons who were all of an age where they could have been involved. And there's later evidence that maybe there was some guilt. Um, that some members of the Rogers family felt, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I can't go into all of that, but it's in the book. <laughs> um, then we have a new character on our scene um, in 1686. So now Joan, the, the young woman who was born here, she's a teenager. John Jackson arrives, much like Maria had a generation earlier, as an 18-year-old enslaved teenager from the West Indies so from the sugar plantations, um, a, a really brutal form of uh, slavery and work um, brought by a ship captain from New London who, who bought him himself, brought him to New London, and for a couple of years, the teenager John Jackson works at the harbor as a stevedore, so unloading and loading ships for the ship captain who purchased him. Then by a, just a quirk of fate and a a deal gone bad. Um, the, uh, John Jackson ends up being sold to none other than the Rogers family, the same family, this wealthy, large mercantile family that owned Joan. And um, John, John will emerge here as a truly extraordinary figure, John Jackson. He came here around, say, the 16, in 1686. By 1700, he's free. We don't know exactly how, um, but in, he I was either was able to purchase or was manumitted, which is it's quite unusual at this really early period. This did not happen often. And he stayed in it. Um, his, his master, an enslaver, uh, John Rogers, um, they remained uh, connected for the rest of their lives. So for example, John, even after John Jackson was free, um, he built his own house on John Rogers' property. He lived there, he even shared, it's described as sharing it with a, with a white couple, which is pretty interesting. And um, so he was really a man to be reckoned with, um, even, in just his uh, 20s, in his early 20s. And so John Jackson comes here and he meets Joan and they marry. Now, the one, one problem is, and this is, again, this is how the Jackson family really shows some of the, the problems and the, uh, what it was like for a family uh, of African origin in this period, um, they would, for the rest of their lives, straddle slavery, servitude, and freedom. Because freedom, we have to be careful, often, usually, freedom if you were poor meant servitude. So it didn't mean you know, freedom to do whatever you wanted. Um, but John Jackson was free, he was legally free, so he married Joan, but she was still enslaved. And she was enslaved by another part of the Rogers family. You know, it was actually siblings. And they were about four miles away. And they, man they began their married life four miles away, um, seeing each other. They actually had two children. 
during that time. The first one is our Adam, and the second one was a little girl named Miriam. And within three years of marriage, then Joan also secures her freedom, the mom. So here you have, so sounds like it's gonna be a good you know, ending to the story. Um, uh, both parents have become free. But the reality of, of the law at the time um, was that uh, a child's legal status came from their mother at the time of their birth. So because Joan was enslaved at the time of her birth, both Adam and Miriam would remain in slavery. And when she left to join her husband in freedom in their own house, she had to leave her two children behind, ages one and three. Um, and there's an incredible testimony in one of the court records that talks, that describes Joan Jackson going back and forth between the two households to, quote, nurse her babies. So, so Adam, going back to Adam, you know, now he's, he never got to live with his father. His mother is now taken away from him. But I will say this, they maintain close contact and a sense of family. And the Jacksons manage to, even though their family is separated over time and geography and, and status, they manage to maintain a sense of family throughout all of this, which is pretty extraordinary. And you can see traces of it in Joshua's diary, including Adam going to visit his sister who's enslaved in Norwich, or going to visit his father who's free in New London. So um, I'll, I'll say one other thing about the Rogers family who owned them. Okay, <laughs> I'm running out of time. Um, Okay, I think I'm gonna skip that. I wanna say a few things about Adam Jackson's work and life and sort of his typicality um, in terms of his working life. So what was the, li the life of, so this is sort of the typical New England scenario. Uh, one enslaved person in a house with a big English family. Um, when Adam arrived here at 27 years old, um, there were only three rooms in the house. There were 10 people already living in it. So, and that included Joshua, kids. Um, one of his sons was married and had two of his own kids. Joshua's elderly mother who was sick. Um, so the idea of privacy, slavery in these small New England households occurs in a very tight domestic space. Um, you can hear everything, you can see everything. Um, earlier historians sometimes use the word or the concept of family slavery. Um, with the idea that maybe it's better to be in a, you know, in a household like this than in plantation slavery in the 19th century, for example. But um, you also have, it is true that it meant there was less differentiation, so less differentiation of work, and uh, Joshua had no space for another place for someone to sleep or anything like that. So they're all in the same building. Um, but it also means that Adam, is living with his enslavers every minute of every day. Um, and there's no escape from that. Um, so he was a very accomplished husbandman and farmer, took care of animals. And I'll just, I'll end by giving you a snippet of um, what happened with his parents, which is really an incredible story. Um, so, Adam is left behind as a child. His parents go off, they're free, and they are described in records at this point. This is when they built their own house. John is working, um, and they're living with uh, an English family, but, and they're described as prosperous, which is pretty, pretty good. This all came crashing down in 1710, and the Rogers family, a big wealthy family. They also were very contentious and kind of a dysfunctional family, and they litigated with each other a lot. One of the strands of this litigation was the Jackson family itself. Ownership of them, were they free? Would they be enslaved? Um, and, and so parts of the Rogers family are fighting over this. And one strand of this litigation, um, like the bad part of the Rogers family, they end up winning. So there's a knock on the door of the Jackson household, 
and the constable comes and takes away Joan Jackson. She's seven months pregnant and she has her little two-year-old with her. They take them away and they re-enslave them with another, another member of the Rogers family in New York. So now they're on Long Island, which seems like a world away for, for um, John Jackson and his, and his other children. And how does John Jackson react? So this is 1710. He is a freedman. He is, has no money. He is illiterate. Um, and he, English is probably not his first language. He fights. He fights. Um, and the first thing he does is he goes with his former master. They go into a boat in the middle of the night, cross Long Island Sound, break into the house where uh, Joan and the children are, and, quote, steal her out of the house with the children, sail all the way back. And I've been told that's an amazing feat of sailing. <laughs> um, and then sends her into Rhode Island into a variety of safe houses to try to get her out of um, enslavement. I can't go through all the wrinkles of the story, but suffice to say, and maybe we can change the, the slide, suffice to say that um, the family was split up several times and in many different ways, both from enslavement and legally from these lit this litigation. And John Jackson fought for the next seven years. He fought um, you know, physically by going and trying to retrieve his family, but he also fought in the courts. He fought in Connecticut courts, and then when his wife and children were sent um, to Massachusetts to the slave markets of Boston and sold, he then went, he became a street peddler so that he could go and see them. And then he, in the Middlesex County courts, he fought for them. Seven years later, he won their freedom. Um, so this was the kind of man that Adam's father, John Jackson, was. And, and I don't mean to gloss it over as being like, it must have been just pure agony um, and incredibly diff difficult. And there was, they were poor, um, but they did interestingly have the backing of their former enslavers, the Rogers. They were the ones who were financially backing the, um, the legal cases. So um, I should say they're among the Rogers, especially to this crowd. The Rogers had their own religion. That's crazy. Um, and they called it the Rogerines. I could go on. Um, but one of the things that they did do, they were pretty crazy, but one of the things they did do was they were among the first people to just question that maybe slavery was wrong, even as they were enslaving people. And it seems that this kind of tension is acted out in the lives of the Jacksons. And while it was horrible for the Jacksons to live, in terms of the historical record, it allows us, all of these 30 years of court cases allows us to actually see what happened to this incredible family that straddled slavery and freedom in early New England. And then I'll close with this. So again, finding Adam's really hard in the diary, finding John Jackson's even harder, because I have no direct sources. He did not write himself, but I did find this, um, this is after he stole his wife and children, and I say steal because that's what the crime was called. Um, um, he was brought into court. This is his bond of appear appearance, so basically like bail bond, you know? And he has to sign it along with his sponsors. And I nearly died when I saw, this is his actual mark. Um, the third one from the top with the red spot, it says the mark of John Jackson, and you see a squiggly kind of zero, you know, uh, circle. Most marks, and I, I even find, you know, most marks were X's. So John, he had to be different. You know, he had to be himself in, in creating something that was just a little bit different and more unique. So one more slide. I'll just close with this image from the Hempstead House the house that uh, Adam and Joshua lived in for more than 30 years. This is the garret or the attic space. And it was probably here, I think this space sort of symb symbolizes the intersection and the intersection of families. Um, it was here that Adam lived for more than 30 years. Alongside 
um, uh, other male members of the household, so they would have all slept up in the garret, almost like dormitory style. So, and it looks, uh, it's rather poignant, I think. So, thank you. Any questions for Professor Bonaventura? Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. So the question is, I just repeat so folks can hear, is how could John Hempstead have survived um, through all of this? So I think what you're getting at is as a widower, was, was Adam essential to his survival? So people ask that question a lot. Um, I actually think n not in that sense, in the sense that Adam didn't take over care of, Adam was the same age as one of Joshua's sons. So he was not in, a, in the position to take care of children for uh, Joshua. What he did do is replace labor that Joshua desperately needed. Um, and it was male labor, not female labor. And it allowed Joshua to have this fairly, you know, I mean, it's very local, but public career. Became justice of the peace, representative to the General Assembly. He couldn't have done any of those things without Adam, nothing. And also just his general economic um, production, you know, for the household and for trade, um, Adam was absolutely essential. Um, so no, Joshua absolutely could not have lived his life, but not so much about the kids. I will say one thing about kids though. Um, very late in life, um, one of Joshua's sons died and uh, Joshua became the uh, guardian of two of his grandsons. And there, I don't think he could have taken on his grandsons without Adam. Adam was in the, put in the role of kind of surrogate fa father. And I say that, you know, guardedly in the sense that they spent the majority of their working time, the children, with Adam, not with Joshua. So he relied on him heavily to raise those two boys, boys who would grow up to be able to own him. Yes, sir, in the back. Um, my question is just about the first 27 years of Adam's life yeah. before he was enslaved. I, I, I know obviously through his father you knew some things, but just curious what the first 27 years of Adam's life. Sure, so, so Adam. I'm just gonna repeat yeah. so folks online can hear. So the question is, what was the first 27 years of Adam's life like being enslaved? So. Um, Adam lived in a extended Rogers household, um, as I said. So he was born enslaved because his mother was enslaved when he was born. And his sister came two years later. So I, I do feel like the two of them were very, very tight and they grew up together. They were the only two you know, siblings in, who were left enslaved and in this household. And that's the sister that Adam actually goes and visits when he's a middle-aged man, um, back and forth. It's Miriam that he visits. Um, so he would have lived, this is speculation. Um, from the place where they lived, he lived kind of in the hinterlands of, of what was called New London. So in an area that was really where the Mashantucket Pequot um, uh, area now is. And um, which was even now is, is pretty rural. And I think it was very rural at the time. So pretty isolated. Um, his master was a fell monger. So he sold furs. So a lot of Native Americans would have been coming in and out of the household um, as suppliers. Um, and he learned um, farming trade. And it's absolutely, how do I know that? Um, when he arrived at Joshua's, um, house t at 27, he was already skilled um, in terms of farming, um, animal husbandry. He, 
He also could operate an ox cart, which I don't know much about oxen, but um, I researched it, and apparently it's really hard to do alone. So this, this man was a very skilled and experienced um, farmer and husbandman. And okay. he would have learned that as, from, from a small age. Along with the sons of his, of his enslaver, of his master, yes. Um, so um, all male children would have learned sort of farming skills unless they were of a very higher, much higher class, you know, kind of from the age of five, six on. Can you take another question? Definitely. We have a question from our virtual audience. Have you found any descendants of Adam, Joan, and John Jackson and or the Rogers family? Oh, the Rogers are so many. There's so many. <laughs> There's probably a couple of them here, actually. <laughs> There's so many. There's so many. Um, so, yeah, and uh, the, this religion that they created, the Rogerines, um, this was like a family religion. So. It basically was just within families and a neighborhood, and they, that's a whole story in and of itself, um, where they're in conflict, you know, in and out of jail and burning down the meeting house and um, <laughs> disrupting a congregational meeting by John Rogers would come in with a um, wheelbarrow full of shoes that he had made, screaming and trying to sell them in defiance of the, the prohibition on working on the Sabbath. So they were a very interesting um, group. But yes, they have many, many, many descendants. The Jacksons, the Hempsteads have many descendants, although they, I think they moved out to the Midwest largely um, in sort of the 19th century. Um, and I'm a historian, so I'm, I don't really deal with living people. But um, uh, the Jacksons, and presumably, so uh, Adam Jackson actually had eight siblings, so I think it's very likely that there is someone who survived, because most of his siblings got married. Adam never got married, which is really unusual. Um, and like Joshua, you have these two single men. It's very unusual. Um, so, but I don't know, I don't know the answer and, and if they have been identified, not to my knowledge. Thank you. I'll take one more question in the back. Okay. Um, so the question is about any record of the use of violence in the diary. So and this, I, you know, spent a lot of time on this question. Um, and okay, what I can tell you, I know almost nothing about his life before the diary. So I, I really can't say anything specific to his individual experience. Um, the diary and then just going to Joshua and Adam, <laughs> There, Joshua doesn't mind saying things that are negative about people who work for him, for example. But in this 47-year diary, he only says something negative about Adam three times. And they're relatively mild descriptions also. So again, what can we extrapolate from that? I mean, not a lot, other than that it doesn't appear that there was a lot of conflict between them or not enough that it would rise to the level of Joshua writing about it. Um, I mean, jo I, I'll say that Joshua didn't write about, you know, uh, using violence himself. So what I did do, though, is I looked at it through these hundred years of court records in the locality. I, there were incidents of violence, um, including one horrible one, that, and I put them all in the book, um, of a nine-year-old child who was beaten to death by a very elite man in New London. Um, and so, so I tried to get at the violence that was there, that was going on, through other sources that I could document. And there are other diarists, um, slaveholding diarists from the period. And again, this is a really early period, so our, we're, we're somewhat hobbled by our sources. Um, uh, 
that did write about the uh, how they beat their their enslaved uh, 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 people who who were in their households, um, or even sold them vindictively, you know, separated families, those kinds of things. Um, so we don't have evidence of that directly in Adam's particular case, but we have the whole evidence of his entire family being separated, ripped apart, uh, uh, re-enslaved over and over again. And I've wondered if one of the reasons he didn't get married, because he probably could have gotten married, it would have been very normal for him to get married, and Joshua himself, as a justice of the peace, often married enslaved people. I always wondered if he had seen and experienced so much trauma as a child that maybe he thought the easiest way to avoid being, you know, separated from my family is by not having one. All right. Thank you.